My name is Stacey Metlin. I uh, work for a nonprofit called The Partnership for New York City. We represent the business community in New York, and I specifically focus on transit, where I work with the MTA to run a public-private partnership to help test new technologies that solve their pressing challenges. And I am very excited to chat with some incredible thought leaders today from both the public and private sector around how the importance of a multimodal seamless journey is to our transit network and what both cities from Pittsburgh to cameras uh, using AI to help better enforce bus lanes to e-scooters, what they're all contributing to this broader network that we will need to have to really make sure people can get where they need to go. Um, so with that, before I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, but I want to just get a little audience poll before I do so. Um, I'm gonna ask everybody if you're either in the public sector, private sector, or other nonprofit NGO space. So can everybody raise your hand if you're in the public sector? Okay, got some, some deep public sector folks. Uh, private sector, okay. And then other? or other organizing bodies, amazing. Okay, so pretty split, 50-50, great. Um, well, I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, we're gonna start with Kim, and Kim, in your introduction, can you also share, not just introduce yourself, but also share how you are helping to create a seamless multimodal journey? Absolutely, so Kim Lucas, I'm with the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I also like to call us Everytown America, having been bi-coastal most of my career and life. I appreciate being in a place that I think is a very, very relatable to much more of the US. I'm the director of the city's Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, and we are responsible for 1,000 miles of roadway, 150 city-owned bridges, over 800 sets of public steps, all of the right-of-way permitting and inspections, um, and the mobility planning and policy to serve our residents, with our number one goal being making sure that people can get around safely. Um, I think I was invited to this panel today to talk a little bit about our mobility as a service program called Move PGH, where we are bringing together all of the shared mobility options into one digital location, which is the transit app, and to co-located areas called mobility hubs so that the transfers between different modes are as seamless as possible. And as part of that work, we are in the recruitment phase of a guaranteed basic mobility pilot where we're breaking down that final barrier to using these shared services, which is that cost barrier. Amazing. Looking forward to digging into that. Um, Brandon, you're up next. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Brandon Long, and I am with Hayden AI. Um, what uh, Hayden AI does is uh, we work with transit organizations to deploy uh, edge-based computing devices uh, mounted with, uh, mated with cameras that allow transit agencies to see vehicles that block bus lanes and park in front of bus stops. Uh, our big objective is to make sure that buses are going to continue to run on time and improve their on-time performance, as well as remain accessible for anybody that is in a uh, population of some of our most vulnerable communities who may not be able to access a bus unless it's fully able to pull into a stop. Uh, that's how we're able to help positively influence a multimodal journey, it's by making sure that buses continue to remain uh, running on time and to even improve some of those on-time speeds. Amazing. Vivian? Hi, this is Vivian Mertides, um, Head of Partnerships and Policy for Helbiz, and we're a, a shared micromobility company. And we are um, really working with cities and universities to identify um, that last mile and understand you know, how we can help connect, whether you take a bus, then grab a scooter, take a bike, come in on a train and really trying to connect communities and find ways to um, really promote sustainability and get folks out of cars and onto a scooter or bike uh, to get around the town. Great. Um, so first up, in the pre-call, we had a very interesting steamy discussion, which I'm excited to bring to this broader group. Um, we discussed that seamless mobility requires a two-part investment. And that's one, frictionless operating experience for the customers to make sure that it's easy to use bike, scooter, bus, and transfer between those modes. And then two, equally important, infrastructure improvements to enable easy multimodal movements. So with that, 
Can you all share how you're making progress on each of these parts? And we'll start with Kim. Sure, so I already gave you a bit of an overview of our mobility as a service program. I'll give you a little story about why this is important. So I attended that reception the first night that was not that geographically far from here. It was about four miles. And I stood right here in between a bike share station and a scooter pod waiting for 20 minutes for a lift to come pick me up to then spend 30 minutes in a car with a stranger and stop and go traffic. Even though there was a bike lane, there were bikes, and someone who used to manage bikes, I did not make that choice to use it. Why? Part of it was a navigation issue. You know, I didn't feel comfortable in the dark figuring out a new city. Part of it was I have a Lyft app that works at my house and works at this house. And so trying to make that experience where people can choose the modes that are affordable, that are good for congestion management, that are good for safety on our streets, trying to make it that easy as it is to call a car, to get on a bike or to get on transit is, is the vision. And um, we know that even when those modes are kind of together in an app, which we do not have the deep and native integration that we want, you can pay for a bus transit trip using the app, you can pay for a bike share trip using the transit app, but you can't pay for a scooter trip and you can't pay for a zip car. And those are the two other main components of our Move PGH program. Um, in the absence of having that be deeply integrated, people are still gonna take modes that we don't want them to do. But we're moving the needle. And I think the thing that's really interesting about Pittsburgh doing it is that years ago, this, this is the result of an RFP. Pittsburgh saw what other cities were doing with regards to scooters and, and dockless mobility and saw an opportunity to do it a little bit differently and say, you know what, we're gonna ask the industry to come together and to come to us with a streamlined offering. And that is how today the partnership with multiple entities that have changed their names in the two years, um, in the year and a half since we launched, um, but that is how this group, this collective came together. And so by having that relationship from the get-go with the industry and being hand in hand, we've provided an opportunity for exclusive operations and an easier way for a very small staff like mine to manage because there's not a million operators out there. That's fascinating. I'm gonna ask a follow-up question just with that. So you issued an RFP to get partners together. Is the city paying these operators or how does the partnership work? Yeah, so we um, have an operating agreement with, so I, I didn't even tell you all who all is included. So Zipcar is the car sharing provider, Spin is the scooter provider, Pittsburgh Regional Transit, formerly known as the Port Authority, is the public transit provider, Pogo Bike Share, which formerly known as uh, Healthy Ride, is the bike share provider, and we had um, Waze Carpool in there as well. And so we actually don't have a contract with any of these folks. We have an operating agreement with SPIN to allow them to operate on our streets, which by the way, for those who don't know, the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, e-scooters are not street legal. The only place that you can ride an e-scooter legally in the Commonwealth of PA is in my city as part of this two-year pilot. That's part of the reason that an RFP came out in like 2018, and we didn't launch till 2020. That runway meant that we had the benefit of having a little bit of time to strategize about exactly what we wanted that system to look like and to learn from other cities. But your question was, are we paying for it? No, we are not. And for every scooter trip that's taken, a small amount of money is put into a fund that the city gets to determine how to use on infrastructure and other programmatic investments. So we're actually, in some ways, making money off of the program. But it is challenging because in a city where, quite frankly, we had a bridge collapse in January of this year, people look at programs like this and they're like, why are you scooters? No, you got big problems. And it is a false dichotomy. You know, We have to be investing in all of it. And the reality is what we're investing in this program is negligible compared to really what we do with most of the departments, $200 million in capital projects, but it has such a huge impact. Great. Vivian, on that note, you know, thinking about scooters and, and you represent, you know, micromobility company, how are you thinking about these two separate topics around frictionless operating experience and infrastructure improvements? Yeah, I think that there's definitely um, a real need. I'll start with infrastructure. I think really exactly what Kim said earlier is people sometimes are hesitant to take a scooter because there's not safe infrastructure. They don't feel safe going you know, um, on a busy road. Uh, oftentimes, some cities regulate the speed 
in some cases to seven miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, going next to a 40 mile per hour car, that's a little bit frightening. And so I think there needs to be a, a broader conversation about how do people feel safe to make sure that they feel that they can take that as an option, both for biking and for scooters. Um, so that's something that you know we've actually aligned with the bike community. Um, at first, people were thinking bikes and scooters would be on opposite sides, but frankly, there is an opportunity to work together to improve infrastructure overall. And so that's something that we're really um, you know passionate about and working on. So infrastructure is a, a big key conversation to making this um, accessible and frankly usable for folks. Um, and then in terms of fric frictionless, um, that's another thing that's super important. I think one of the challenges is historically the contracts or operating agreements with cities have been still in the pilot phase, so six months or a year. And so that has really limited the opportunity for businesses um, to be real partners with cities and have a long-term commitment to you know, to build that R&D, to build that friction list, to, to really work on making things work better. So we're now glad we're moving into the situation when we're getting longer contracts so that we can make the commitment um, for resources and R&D to make those deep integrations to make it possible. So in the interim, we're working with, um, with cities and universities and understanding, you know, give us space at those bus stops, give us space at those train stations so at least we can stage them there and then work on the deep integrations to make it really frictionless. In the pre-call, you mentioned that you're working with Miami and helping provide seamless uh, mobility integration. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so like I said, that's, that's part of the first phase of what we're doing is we're um, deploying at uh, the metro stations in Miami-Dade County and working on what's the technology that we need in place to do those deep integrations. So it's a conversation we're having um, really glad that we have some forward-thinking folks in Miami-Dade County who many of them have been here today and you've heard already speak in several different panels. But that's definitely the end goal and something that we're working on. Great. All right. And moving over to you, Brandon. How are you thinking about these two important topics? So th how we've been able to add to, to both of these, I would have to say, would be uh, basically the same answer. We're keeping buses moving on schedule by clearing illegally parked vehicles from in front of bus stops and in bus lanes, um, but also partnering with cities and listening to what their needs are and what it is that their initiatives are so that we can actually add value. Um, probably one of the m most common um, things to, to come out of public-private partnerships, um, or pardon me, uh, private companies trying to work with um, public transit agencies are them shoehorning technologies into these agencies that don't necessarily add value, um, emphasizing the sale above the benefit. And that has created an environment in which a lot of transit agencies are skeptical of new technologies. Um, we're proud to say that we have worked in conjunction with um, New York City MTA, with AC Transit, with a pilot uh, about this time last year with LA Metro, uh, to be able to build out our technology so that it's actually uh, positively impactful to our communities um, and being able to leave uh, these cities with a, a favorable impression of technology companies as a viable partner and as organizations that do have the greater good and the best intents for our communities in which we operate. So, um, yeah, just to, to reiterate, I would say clearing illegally parked bus uh, vehicles from bus lanes and bus stops and actually listening to what the needs of our partners are. Interesting. So would you say if you were to categorize the number one challenge from your perspective getting in the way of enabling residents to easily hop on a bike, to a bus, to a shuttle, what would that be? On-time performance. So in order to be able to really make sure that multimodal transit is going to end up being viable and that we can integrate uh, micromobility with, uh, uh, with uh, public transit, making sure that people have uh, accessible uh, uh, access, access to on-time buses so that they are not left stranded for a period of time, especially in areas where uh, buses may not operate quite as frequently um, as, uh, as we would like. Uh, a five-minute difference in on-time performance can end up having uh, a huge negative impact on what somebody's ability to get from point A to point B will be, and it's also going to end up impacting their desire on uh, whether or not they're going to end up choosing a multimodal journey or public transit as a whole um, when they're thinking of getting from point A to point B. Uh, the best way to keep people out of their cars is making sure that it's going to be reliable and accessible. Great, and, and that's essentially what your technology can help provide. Exactly. Great. 
And then from from the the micro mobility side of the house, what if is your perspective on this? What is the number one key challenge from achieving this broad, seamless, multimodal journey? Now you want me to pick just one? <laughs> well, I, actually, I will piggyback on what you said. I think reliability, and from uh, our perspective, it's, you know, people will get out of a car if they know they've got another option, perhaps. But if there's not enough um, vehicles available, if, you know, sometimes, again, in, in a lot of these programs, cities are a little skeptical starting, and so you might start with a fleet of 100 or a fleet of 200, and, you know, serving a city with 200,000 people, it makes it a little difficult for people to rely that when I need to get out of, you know, work and go to lunch, that there's a vehicle for me to use. So I think having um, accessibility and reliability of there being a vehicle available is really important. Um, I think, you know, again, another big challenge is just seeing that partnership on the long-term perspective from cities to understand that we're working together to solve a long-term problem and having more flexibility in how we um, can address those problems and, and flexibility in that contract or agreement changing as needed, I think is really important. I think um, what Kim's doing uh, in Pittsburgh is amazing. It's, it's great to bring all of that together, to have um, a, a full spectrum of vehicles available because there's different needs depending on where, what you're trying to do. Is it a short trip, a little bit longer trip? And having those options available, I think, really makes a difference. Got it. So having the confidence and reliability of various vehicle types, knowing it's there, on-time performance, two challenges. Kim, do you have a different perspective? Capitalism. <laughs> that is what is getting in the way, probably, of having really robust mobility systems, is this idea that we need to measure their success by how much money they're making, how many butts are in seats. As I think a lot of people have heard me spiel over a couple beers in the last 24 hours, um, we're in a bad situation. We're in a situation, at least in our city, where uh, revenue and ridership are down, so we're gonna reduce service, and then revenue and ridership are gonna go down again, and then we're gonna reduce service, and then maybe the transit system is gonna be in a really bad situation. You know, if we want people to use these modes, they have to be ubiquitous, they have to be easy to use, they have to be affordable. I would love it if we didn't charge people to do these things, because it sucks to not have complete control over your trip. It is, you know, there are a lot of positive externalities of people using all these modes that we're talking about, but we're making them pull out their wallet to do it, and instead we need to be changing the math behind that. Are you using any additional metrics to help quantify and categorize not just, you know, typical on-time performance or just dollars uh, saved, but, you know, that qualitative quantity of life, how you're improving access and access to the critical social determinants of health that transit enables? So thank you for asking. So also, I talk a lot of smack. I don't operate a transit system. It's very easy for me to sit here. I, I used to drive buses. I had a CDL. I have worked in transit operations. So I do have a little bit of that lived experience. But I don't, I'm not the one who's going after those dollars and needing to make that case. However, in our guaranteed basic mobility pilot that I was describing, that is a bona fide empirical research study that we are doing with Carnegie Mellon University. So we went through the IRB process to go and work with human subjects, and we are going to be collecting qualitative information through robust surveying of a very small group of people. I'll be honest, our recruitment is not where we thought it was gonna be. This project is offering free access to unlimited transit, unlimited bike share trips, unlimited scooter trips, I believe, and $60 a month of free car share. And we have a sample size of 50 people that we're trying to recruit. We've got 12 people that are willing to do it so far, which is really disheartening, um, especially for a project that we hand in hand developed with a community organization. So this wasn't one of those things where, you know, we were sitting at our desk in our ivory city tower and saying, we're gonna design a project this way, and then the people will come. It's like, no, we were designing it with the people that work with the people, and we really thought they would come, and so far they haven't. And that's been really, really disheartening, but our hope is that through this research, we will demonstrate that people are able to achieve higher economic outcomes and benefits when you improve their access to mobility options, and we hope that because it'll be empirically sound, that that can shape policy. Yeah, I have a, as a side note, I have a very similar experience and story. Um, I previously uh, had a, a startup that was focused on increasing access to healthy food by getting grocery stores to subsidize Uber and Lyft rides. And for a period of time, 
we and we did a lot of that co-development with community members. We were interviewing them, trying to understand you know the right solution, and to get people to try the solution, we were giving out penny rise just so they can go through the process and see you know here's how you use the technology, here's how you scan it, here's how you can pay in person with cash. Um, through a trusted system, and we thought that we developed this great solution because we did a lot of interviews and we, we developed it with the community. And we had a really hard time getting people to just trust us. And they're like, no, nothing in life is a penny. Why are you scamming me? And similarly, I mean, there's been a lot of distrust in government, and that's a huge barrier when you're trying to provide services and really help improve residents. How, do you, how are you building that trust? Can I ask one quick question? I know I'm stealing the panel. I apologize. Raise your hand if you're tired. <laughs> I've got an almost two-year-old. I've got a pretty demanding job. We're in a global pandemic. I'm tired. And even when you're giving away, I literally once was before the pandemic, was trying to give away free cupcakes on the streets of DC as part of our Capital Bike Share birthday celebration. And people didn't want the free cupcakes. So the real reality is that if anything seems sketchy, like you're saying, distrust of government, if it takes even just downloading an app, like I would rather wait 20 minutes to go four miles. My and tried and true method that I know and that I don't have to think, or I, I already know how it works. It's the yep. psychology. We don't often talk in these spaces, I think, about the psychology, the psychological barriers. And I'm not just talking about like safety and security barriers. I'm talking about like, damn, I'm tired. I don't want to learn a new thing right now. Sorry, I've had an educational experience and I'm saying I don't want to learn. That's problematic, but just wanted to share that. Yeah, and uh, as a scooter provider, many cities often judge us by how many equity rides you know, do you, how many people have you signed up for your equity program? And it is a challenge. It is so hard to give away free rides. So one of the things that we've approached cities with now is saying, okay, these are your five equity zones, let's say. Any ride that starts and stops from that area, we won't charge, period. You don't even have to sign up. But on the flip side, then as a city, don't charge us for those rides. And so that's something that we are exploring with different um, areas because, you know, sometimes we're like, We've only signed up three people this month, and the city's horrified by those metrics. We're like, we are out there trying. We are working with the community, and it is nearly impossible to sign up folks for our trip. So finding unique ways and having, again, as I mentioned, that flexibility with, um, with a city, with what our metrics are, I think is really important for a successful program. 100%. And so that feeds very well into the next question, specifically thinking about vulnerable communities. And so maybe Brandon, uh, starting with you, how are you ensuring that the transit networks you foster are prioritizing vulnerable customers or communities that have been historically marginalized or disadvantaged? This, disadvantaged? So I'm not going to lie. Um, in a lot of my responses, I'm going to sound like a little bit of a one-trick pony because our solution is fairly simple. It really boils down to us in that uh, um, we're, you know, bus riders are um, uh, oftentimes members of uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, we are trying to increase uh, equity by increasing on-time performance, making sure that folks can actually get from point A to point B in uh, the fastest way, um, the most economical way that their situation allows them to, um, and being able to help agencies to expand a lot of these programs. Um, we believe that uh, one of the best ways to be able to expand transit in um, major um, metropolitan markets is going to be through the implementation of new BRT corridors and the best way to be able to increase the speeds of these BRT corridors and enforce the right of way is through an autonomous solution such as ours. Um, so we're really trying to make sure that we are uh, affecting these communities positively uh, by making sure that these uh, systems that are are so impactful and, and going to be uh, invested in in the future uh, will end up um, remaining beneficial and, and keeping people uh, moving on time. So I have another question for you, which I did not ask you in advance, so it's okay if you say that you don't have this information. Um, do you have any, have you done before and after studies to understand how much you are actually affecting on time performance and how you, you've been able, how this technology helps? So we're compiling that study right now. Um, so I don't actually have any numbers on that, but uh, what I can tell you is that uh, in Los Angeles, when we ran our pilot this time last year, uh, we ran our pilot on two buses. Um, both of these buses were running in the month of November, um, including on Thanksgiving. So obviously the week leading up to Thanksgiving, traffic was a little bit lower. It's, uh, there's the week of Thanksgiving, we are going to see fewer violations. With those two buses, we were still seeing 
800 violations between the two of them for uh, for uh, delivery vehicles and, and passenger vehicles parking in bus lanes for that entire month of November. So that's 400 violations per bus per day, that's over, or uh, per bus per month, that's over 10 per day. And that was just with these two buses that we were running. So uh, if we were to break that down in terms of uh, safety scoring, in terms of on-time performance, um, like I said, that's something that we're working to do right now with some of our major deployments, but it's, it's significant. The, the impact of parking in a bus lane is very, very significant. Just to be clear, your technology, it won't necessarily help um, in that very moment but it, it provides that nudge for if, if somebody gets a ticket because they parked in a bus, bus only lane, then they know in the future and, and hopefully over time this reduces, that, that's, that's what you're so for? It, it's twofold. Um, it is about correcting that behavior, absolutely. Um, so making sure that people understand the consequences of parking in bus lanes. And in the state of California, I wanted to be clear, the first 60 days of any program that's implemented are dedicated to sending out warnings. So people understand that if you do this again, and it's day 61, you're going to receive a ticket. Um, however, there is, uh, our solution uh, does communicate with the back office in real time, so there is a world in which we could potentially work with the transit agency to deploy vehicles to <laughs> tow people that are parked in bus lanes um, in near real time. Um, so quick correction is definitely something that we can work with cities if that's something that they would prefer and if that's something that's legally allowed. Interesting. Okay, so Vivian, do you also have, do you have anything else to add around how you are uh, prioritizing vulnerable communities in your design? Like I mentioned, it's really working on um, the community outreach as much as we can. We de definitely see the challenge of getting folks to sign up for our program, so trying to be innovative in how to do things. The other thing is, is looking at offering different vehicle types. Um, some people may not be comfortable with a stand-up scooter, some prefer a seated scooter, some prefer a bike. So having multiple vehicle options is a way um, that we can make sure that there's um, options for people. Got it. Kim? Uh, boring government answer is by making sure that we are making, even though I said yesterday, I like waved my hands and said data. Uh, making data-driven decisions and making sure that safety is our common denominator for design choices, for looking for gaps in where we hear from people. We launched our traffic calming program in 2019, which is really our speed hump program, and we've received about a thousand requests in three years for this program that's able to do about 10 installations a year. And, those, and we're not receiving requests from all of our communities. And by looking at problems, by looking at a program like that and saying, wow, super successful, tons of interest, People like it, oh wait, but if we're only doing stuff where people are asking for it and those communities have agency and other communities that might have greater need are not asking for it, we need to change how we're identifying project needs. And so by doing you know, robust planning and looking for gaps in where we're hearing from folks and being proactive with our programs is how we're prioritizing communities that have been historically underserved. Yep, great. And then Kim, another question for you. So public transportation suffers from a chicken and egg problem. Reduced ridership means reduced rev revenue, which means reduced service, which means reduced ridership, you know, the, the cycle of death. Um, how do we reverse this trend? Yeah, so I touched on this a little bit earlier, which is this, um, how you're measuring success of those systems and not reducing investment when you don't have a lot of ridership and instead seeing a lag and asking more questions about why people aren't using it and then making the system more robust. So often, and I think, well, I know that micromobility suffers from this, car sharing suffers from this. When you don't have a critical mass of a resource that people can find it everywhere that they're gonna need it and take it everywhere they're trying to go, they're not gonna use it. And so having limited service might mean that there's a lot of latent demand for these services. And so in my fantasy, you know, we grab a bunch of this federal money that's coming online and experiment with just really ignoring the trends of recently and investing in better service and making it so that you don't have to pull something out of your pocket and pay to get on that service and doing all the good transportation planning stuff about cost of parking and prioritizing the curb for the modes that you want to encourage and, and all of that good stuff and make it work really well. You know, and sometimes that is a technology solution. Brandon, Vivian, do you have anything to add? We're all moving to become part of her free program. She's got 12, we got 14, 15, 16, 17. Let's all head over there. 
honestly, I don't have anything to add. I feel like that was very well stated. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Brandon and Vivian, representing private sector, what is one thing that you just wish the public sector would understand? So right now, there is uh, $66 billion worth of IIJA funding that is available to fund new technology initiatives for, uh, for the uh, public sector. Um, the solutions that we provide, um, not only, I mean, shameless plug, not only are we willing to give free pilots to make sure that our solution is beneficial for uh, the areas in which we are operating, but in order to fully deploy them, the federal government right now is willing to foot a major, major portion of what the cost will actually end up being. Uh, this is going to end up being hugely impactful for the communities in which um, will benefit the most from this kind of technology, and we're really hoping that uh, a lot of areas understand what this is actually going to mean for them. And I think from our perspective, it's, as I mentioned before, just having um, a long-term partnership and relationship with um, our cities to understand that we want to develop um, technologies or programs that will really benefit. Um, but we need to be, um, we need to have more than a one year contract to be able to, to understand what the goals are that we're working on. We need to work together and come to the table and have that flexibility to essentially create pilots within our contracts to understand what works and have the flexibility because, you know, things change in what a community needs and what's available and, and again having the, uh, the flexibility to, um, to increase a, a fleet to try in a certain um, area if that's gonna work and look at our technology and look at our data, understand where the app opens, where's the, the, the desire for, um, for an expanded program. So really just having some flexibility but a longer term project so that we can um, work side by side to, to make the program successful. Yeah, open dialogue. And Kim, from the public sector, what is one thing you just wish the private sector would understand? Well, I think we've been talking a little bit about this on the sidelines, but you know, coming to the public sector and asking us what our needs are, what are our problems, and then shaping your business and your technology to serve those versus the reverse, which I think happens a lot. Um, you know, you guys have probably heard me say a lot in the last 48 hours, those delivery robots, I can see one right now. Please put a camera on, well, use your camera to do automated inf enforcement of my protected bike lanes. You know, we were, um, we had a pilot with KiwiBot and they were gonna collect data about sidewalk condition and things like that. I think there's an opportunity to really find the use cases at the government, which by the way, like we're probably sticking around the government for a while and we're gonna have access to a lot of money. And so it really benefits you to build a use case, build a product around my use case because then I will buy it from you. And there's a lot that I'm not hearing about in these spaces that will make you a lot of money. And if I had more time and I wasn't so tired, maybe I'd pursue some of this stuff myself. But I will give you those answers. So come to us, ask us what our needs are and, and let us tell you Automated enforcement, collect the citation money, you will make money from that, the program will pay for itself, and my streets will be safer. Amazing. So the reason I ask this is because I've had experience in the private sector, I've had experience in the public sector, I now straddle both, where I work with both the public and private sector to uh, work together to demonstrate how technology can solve those ultimate broad public sector challenges, and working with entrepreneurs every day and working with incredible public servants who are, are working so hard to just get the bus to run and, and do daily operations. I think from my perspective, one thing that, I mean, there's, there's actually two things that I think are, would be very helpful for both sides to understand. And it's one, it will be so much easier if we all just like come together and think about how are we solving this together and not have this like, you're out to get me or this like, adverse mentality and if we come from the start with this attitude of like we're working together towards a shared outcome and then two oftentimes I notice a lot of new innovative companies they have great technology and they're super technical and they talk and they're jargon also public sector is guilty of this too we have all of the acronyms and you know we, we don't necessarily you know are very straight with how we think about procurement and it's this big black box so just breaking down the language and being and talking about what do you actually want to do? How are you making things cheaper, easier, more efficient? Like, what are you actually doing 
to make sure that we ultimately are delivering the best service as possible to residents who need transit and so everybody can rely on transit. That's our overall shared goal, so what are we doing there? Um, so just we're all in this together and, and let's all come along for the journey. I'd love to piggyback on that for a moment. Um, so uh, being one of those technology companies that is uh, offering a, a solution to cities and transit agencies, um, I would have to say that one of the most impactful things for us is making sure that we have identified a solid need and come up with a solution that doesn't shoehorn an unnecessary technology down somebody else's throat. Um, the origin of our company is about two and a half years ago, our CEO was riding a bus and that bus was supposed to be going down a BRT lane and had to continue to move out of that BRT lane because vehicles were parked in it. Um, very simple observation, realize that there's no solution to keep buses uh, from, uh, to keep people from parking in BRT lanes. Um, he had a, a little bit of a technology background in the camera space, so he understood the technology necessary to be able to create the solution. And then he called up AC Transit, he called up New York City MTA, and he immediately started working with these agencies who were very eager to find a solution to a well-defined problem. Um, so that's my message to any entrepreneurs that are in the audience or listening to the webcast or looking at a recording later, don't try to develop unnecessary technology. Oftentimes, and, and I'll, I'll, pretty much every single time, right now, in the world we live in, there are plenty of problems that can be solved by the most simple technology. Think about what's actually going to be beneficial to the community at large and think about what's going to be, and prioritize that over the, the bottom line. Yeah, and just because it's some really cool new tech or new engineering problem that you're solving doesn't mean it actually has a real life purpose. Anyways, um, I'll get off my soapbox. Um, so I would love to hear from the audience. Uh, do we have a, okay, thank you. Thank you. Is it on? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks for the great conversation. Um, this is a question maybe more for Kim, but also Brandon, I'm curious your thoughts too. Um, so I live here in LA, downtown, the west side, Santa Monica, Culver City, there have been a lot of improvements lately, a lot of new bike lanes going in, Expo light rail, of course, and, and little Tokyo station here. Um, so there's some infrastructure improvements happening, there's some service level improvements happening, frequency improvements, things like that. Um, but we still see issues all the time with like blocked bus lanes, blocked bike lanes, delivery trucks, cars. Um, and then with the light rail, you know, a lot of grade level crossings, they're stuck in the same traffic that everyone else is. Um, so my question is, how do we make it less desirable to get in the car in the first place? Not so much how do we make all these other modes connect better, but how do we get people out of their cars? And what are your thoughts on that? Are you looking into like road pricing, congestion pricing or anything like that? or? reducing parking minimums, that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, it's money. It's making people pay to drive their car and to use your roads in a way that they have not before. Um, I have to admit that we're not in Pittsburgh right now looking at congestion pricing. Um, and I do wonder, you know, again, I'm every town America. I'm a city that has half the population we once had and all of the infrastructure obligations that we've always had. We are a city that almost went bankrupt. And so, the idea of doing things that I recognize the long-term vision would become a more visible city or livable city when people can get around without their cars really easily. But I also think that the political appetite to charge people to come in and like generate tax revenue would be really, it's not one that we're fighting for right now. But, you know, by making all those other modes actually work really well, they will attract people. And that's one of the kind of challenges is in the absence of that, which by the way, Pittsburgh had one of the highest pre-COVID transit um, mode share for our downtown. We are a city that was built on walking. You know, you heard me say over 800 sets of public steps. We used to have 17 inclines in our city. So we're a city that, tip, like for real, was built for this. So it's land use so that people can get to places they need to go, charging people with parking, which is something we do very well, um, and making sure that there's access to other great modes. Because you can't just tell people to get out of their cars if you don't have places for them to go. I think that the answer is absolutely that. And it's also 
I mean, it's, it's an incredibly complicated answer, uh, especially in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a community, it's a city that is built on the automobile. The, the three major American automobile manufacturers used to have manufacturing over in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, racing started in Los Angeles. I mean, the car culture here is strong. Um, I personally don't think that getting somebody out of a vehicle in Los Angeles 100% is going to happen for everybody. And my example for that is, is me. Um, I, up until very recently, I was actually living in Culver City, um, and my child's daycare was about two miles away from me, also in Culver City. And I was very fortunate in that I had a bus that would stop directly in front of my apartment and directly in front of the daycare, so I could go back and forth in about an hour, pick up my children, and be able to, to get them home. Now, on the days when I also had to go to the grocery store, I'm not taking the bus. That's something that's gonna end up being a little bit more complicated, especially with a two-year-old and a four-year-old. So I would, I would have to balance my schedule. Maybe two or three days a week I'm picking up my kids on the bus, two or three days a week I'm going to be driving my vehicle. Um, so in making sure that we're accounting for the fact that it's public transit and multimodal journeys are going to end up being very beneficial to a lot of people and a lot of affected communities, it's not always going to be the answer to absolutely everybody. So making sure that we are going to be making it more attractive through on-time performance and through convenience and better service and multimodal integration, that's all fantastic. But making sure that we understand the needs of people that do truly need to, to drive in vehicles, that's also going to be important as well. So. Um, that's my TED talk. <laughs> Somebody should write several theses about it. You know what I'm hearing, Brandon? <laughs> Sounds like you might be tired. Yeah. <laughs> I hear kids, I hear groceries, I hear time. That is, I mean, again, capitalism, uh, you know, makes us have these lifestyles that make it really hard, you know, and we're lucky that most people in this room have the options um, that benefit our lives, but you've heard it's really expensive to be poor. Yeah, it, there's a time cost too. Personally, I hate putting my kid in his car seat, Sometimes it's very physical. <laughs> he doesn't like it. It's the worst. I would rather it's not It's always drive. the worst. If there was a really wonderful transit connection, and there is from, I mean, I'm a transportation planner, so I did choose to live someplace where I can walk to the T station. Um, I would much rather do that. Like it's less stressful. It can be less stressful. When the systems are built right, and they're easy, and they're affordable, and they're fast, it can be less stressful than what we've got today. And so by building up those great systems and also then like kind of ratcheting up the cost to operate cars and store them in our public space, we can, we can get closer to that future that we want. Absolutely. Yeah, another question? In light of the difficulty you've all experienced with offering free this's and that's, um, how do you look at and what experiences do you know about the emphasis of offering free transit in order to suddenly save our public transit systems and get ridership up. Um, it, it, it's being sold as a panacea and at some great cost in, in many instances. And um, will it work? Has it worked elsewhere? And is the reliability issue really the answer more than that? And how do we then demonstrate that so that we don't all go down this rabbit hole if only free and start tolling roads and making people hate transit possibly, uh, what do we do? Kim, do you have thoughts there? Yeah. I got opinions on this. Uh, so yeah, you can't give away crap, right? Like if, it's a, if we make it free um, and it's still not a system that's gonna serve people, that's not gonna do it. Even if you pay people, if, you, if I say I will pay you $10 to take a bus trip instead of a car trip today, if that bus trip isn't gonna work because of the time or the location or whatever, people aren't gonna use it. And so absolutely don't misconstrue my, what I'm saying is that free is the solution. It's having really robust services that attract people because they're really robust services and then getting rid of that final barrier. Um, I was at a conference two weeks ago called, it was the Global Mass Transit Conference on uh, the future of fair payment and ticketing. And I can't believe they invited me and I can't believe they didn't kick me out because I was saying this stuff to a room full of vendors who were trying to look at like new whiz bang solutions and ways to charge people. And we were talking about facial recognition technologies. And we were talking about all this whiz bang stuff, which costs money. You know, there's a history for some transit systems where they paid more money to collect money than they collected. And so in some places it, it did economically make sense to not charge, but absolutely you're right. It's not, we can't just make it free tomorrow and expect people to use it. It has to work well. Yeah, it has to be convenient, it has to be reliable. I mean, that seems to be the theme that we keep hitting on um, over and over again, and so how do we get there? I think there has to be a political will 
um, to drive it. I think there has to be, you know, what's the balance of pushing, get, finding ways to get people out of cars, making it accessible, convenient, and reliable so that people will make that mode shift. It's, it's a very difficult challenge, um, but, but we're going to keep trying. Los Angeles had the world's largest light rail transit system at one time in the 1920s, okay? That light rail system was taken down in the 1950s and 60s. Now, all of a sudden, you know, this, for the next 50 years, there was car culture and so forth trying to bring back the fixed guideway system, right, in, in other forms in Los Angeles. So the clarification here is in this modern space and time, there are a lot of lessons learned that Los Angeles can share with others. Yeah. I mean, Detroit had the same exact thing happen. So and, and lots of other cities. cities. Who Framed Roger Rabbit does a really good telling of that with the clover leaf getting rid of the trolley, you know? Okay, quick question. In all these discussions, have any of you incorporated the fact that due to the pandemic, people are very used to working from home, except for the people who are forced out? And have you factored that into your planning now that so-called Things have relaxed because, personally, I still like working at home, but I'm at that stage where it's okay. So have you put that into your plan? And as far as freeze concerned, if it's an essential service, I'm willing to pay. That happened with our senior transit service. It was free for a while, but I'll pay the 75 cents. So it's affordable and essential. So Two-part question. You got Anybody who's ever seen me knows I talk a lot. Okay. Most interesting person on this panel. So oh, I just talk a lot. Um, yeah. So um, you know, when I was in D.C., part of the team I managed, you know, we were managing the shared micromobility options for the city, freight and urban delivery, and transportation demand management. And there was so much effort put into trying to do a telework week and try to get people to work from home and a big barrier because companies were like, nobody can work from home. So the pandemic was sort of a godsend in that way that we had this once in a life, hopefully once in a lifetime um, experience where people got people out of cars in a really big way. And so I don't operate transit, um, but it is an opportunity to stop thinking about that nine to five, you know, white collar commuter from the affluent neighborhood to the downtown job. We, they have to think about it differently, and they have to think about how you make a system that works for people for that grocery trip, you know, for, for the folks that maybe would prefer to do it. Um, the other question was on free and there being a cost, and it's, you know, maybe it's just me. I'm a member of Free Cycle. You know, I lived in a co-op in grad school, so maybe it's just my natural proclivity. But there's a mental barrier sometimes to pulling out your wallet, and it's not for people who can afford it, like myself, it's not about the cost per se, it's about the idea that you have to think now. And when I was managing Capital Bike Share for a number of years in DC, we knew that the all you can eat option of charging people $8 a month or whatever, actually it was more than that, but we thought that that got more people to ride because every time you pulled out that key to unlock a bike, you didn't have to think about it. You weren't like, am I gonna spend two bucks on a bike or two bucks on the bus today? And so that's the sort of mentality that I still am convinced of. Um, but you're absolutely right. And, you know, when I was on this panel telling everybody that their life's work was not working because they were on, talking about, like, transit fare collection, I'm like, just don't charge! Uh, you know, I had the guy from Vancouver or somewhere else in Canada say, we surveyed our riders and we asked them, would you rather have better service or would you rather, like, have people pay less? And they were like, we'd rather have better service and we don't want to pay more so that other people can pay less. And I'm like, well, you asked them the wrong question. Nobody's gonna say, I personally want to pay more for my transit trip so that someone else can pay less. Like, not a lot of people are gonna say yes to that. But if you ask them the question of, would you ride more if the system worked really well? And if you didn't have to pull your wallet out for it, maybe. And for people who can't afford it, when you're making minimum wage, two bucks, not having good transfer systems in a lot of cities anymore, like, it adds up. And if you're paying for to get to work an hour equivalent of your salary, of your paycheck, that really does add up for a lot of people. Okay, we have one minute left. We're gonna do quick ending round robin. So, I wanna know three key ingredients for creating an effective, equitable, multi network. 
going to start with you, Vivian. Three. Um, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Um, I think there needs to be, uh, it needs to be accessible, uh, affordable, and um, really great partnership with cities to make it work. Brandon? Frequent, reliable, on-time bus service. Um, bus routes that don't just go downtown. Uh, Cross-town routes that can end up spanning uh, the entire uh, breadth of a city so that uh, accessibility is going to be more than just about commuting. Um, and then uh, bus lane and bus stop enforcement, obviously, to ensure that service remains reliable. Yep. Ubiquitous service, so you got to have those modes that you want people to use. They have to be everywhere reliably. Um, safe infrastructure, for especially for the micromobility, um, because people aren't going to use it if they don't feel safe. And um, really efficient curb management, because the reason people are parking in our bike lanes and our, our bus lanes is because we have not adequately provided loading space for them, and we have not met that need. And so by having those three things, which two of them are kind of the same, so I'll also say there's probably something in there about like human beings and working with people uh, is needed. Um, Amazing, we are out of time. So thank you all for your attention. And thank you to our esteemed panelists who, it was a great conversation. I had lots of fun, I hope you did too.